Well, good morning and welcome to our service. It's a privilege to be able to minister to you as a church in this way. I'm glad you're able to join with us as we seek to worship our God, uh, to praise his name and to learn more about him through his word. Now let's start our service this morning with a word of prayer. So let's pray. Father, we want to thank you as we come before you today. We come to worship you, to give you thanks for your grace and mercy. We acknowledge that your mercy is in you every morning and that your faithfulness is great. Lord, we pray for our country. We pray that you would alleviate the conditions, that you would help this virus to be dealt with quickly and well. We pray that you might sustain this nation. We pray in all of this that people's minds may be turned to the Lord Jesus Christ that perhaps those who have lived a life apart from him may see their need, that they may recognise that they are frail and desperately needy and that through this time many would come to trust the Lord Jesus Christ as their saviour. We thank you for our church, Springwood Baptist Church. We pray for each one that is laid aside, practising social isolation and keeping to themselves as best as possible. Lord, we thank you that even in these circumstances, you are our comforter, that you are present with us and that you encourage us, your people. We pray for this time of worship, that it may be empowered by you, that you may turn our spirits, our, our thoughts towards you, that we may behold our Saviour once more, and that we may be encouraged thereby. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen have some announcements just as we start that I'd like to share with you as a church. We are continuing to upload messages to our church website. They will be uploaded around 10 a.m. on Sundays and 6 p.m. Sunday evening. Next Friday is actually Good Friday and our Prime Minister has made some concessions um, and made it possible for us to minister to you. Um, we will continue to do the same thing we have done and upload a message for the church on Friday morning at 9am, a brief Easter themed message. If you're able to meet as your families, perhaps have one other visitor in your home where appropriate and applicable, please do um, gather as you can, but if not in person, please encourage one another as we go, uh, as we reflect upon our Saviour and his, his gift of salvation enabled through his death on the cross. So Easter coming up next Friday, please be praying for our nation that our thoughts would be turned towards the Saviour. We had a, an online live meeting on Wednesday night, uh, 7 o'clock for our prayer meeting and Bible study. We utilised Zoom as a, as a program where we were able to see one another face to face and have a bit of a, a Bible study. That was a, a blessing for all those that were able to be involved um, we have heard in the news since then that the program Zoom has been having some security issues. Uh, we as a church have kept things quite private in our meeting settings. We've been using a password and using um, all of the recommended um, preventative measures to stop people hijacking or jumping in to our meetings. So we've been doing what we can um, and we are going to continue to use that method next Wednesday if, uh, if the Lord tarries and we're able to. So if you're able and interested in joining with us on Wednesday night, please talk to me and I will help you get set up for that. The last thought that I've had um, that I think is worthy of sharing, if you are looking for some good Christian music, because without the fellowship and without the meeting and the singing of hymns, many of us are a little bit starved for that form of encouragement, I would suggest going to Abiding Radio on, uh, on the internet it is a, a website which streams essentially an online radio station 24-7 with good Christian hymns and songs. Uh, there are a number of different channels you can tune into. My recommendations would be the sacred or the instrumental, um, but please, abidingradio.org, if you're able and interested. It's a wonderful source of encouragement for me, and I think you would find it a blessing. Now, that concludes our announcements. Um, if you would like to sing a couple of hymns as a family um, in, you can even pause now in our meeting.
And you might like to sing number one in our hymn book, O Worship the King, or even 442, Praise Him, Praise Him, in preparation for our message. If you have your Bibles there, please open to the book of Nehemiah. We will have a Bible reading this morning from Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 1. Nehemiah chapter 1, and our reading from verse 1 to the end of the first chapter, the Word of God says, The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, And it came to pass in the month of Chislu, in the twentieth, twentieth year, as I was in Shushan the palace, that Hanani, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me, The remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. And it came to pass, when I heard these words, that I sat down and wept, and mourned certain days, and fasted, and prayed before the God of heaven. And I said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God, that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him, and observe his commandments. Let thine ear now be attentive, and thine eyes open, that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now, day and night, for the children of Israel, thy servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee. Both I and my father's house have sinned. We've dealt very corruptly against thee and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments, which thou commandest thy servant Moses. Remember, I beseech thee, the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, if you transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. But if ye turn unto me and keep my commandments and do them, though there were of you, uh, though there were of you cast out into the uttermost part of the heaven, yet will I gather them from thence and will bring them unto the place that I have chosen to set my name there. Now these are thy servants and thy people, whom thou hast redeemed by thy great power and by thy strong hand. O Lord, I beseech thee. Let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant and to the prayer of thy servants who desire to fear thy name and prosper. I pray thee in this, uh, thy servant this day and grant him mercy in the sight of them, this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. We ask that the Lord might bless the reading of his word and we will spend some time thinking, uh, considering some thoughts that come from the passage here in Nehemiah. Let's pray as we come to open the Word of God and consider it together. Father, we thank you again for your Word. We pray that you might enable the preacher and those that hear to be touched by your Spirit, to be changed by your work in us. Lord, I pray that you might bless this time, and that we might be encouraged in your ways, that we might be challenged as to our desires and our willingness to be used of you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I am in, I'm planning to start a series of messages from the book of Nehemiah. We in this day have facing some uncertainty and some upheaval, but I think the Lord would have us consider a series from Nehemiah. That's our intent going forward on Sunday mornings for the moment. And we will consider a message this morning entitled, The Man God Uses. The Man God Uses. I am going to begin by making the assumption, and I hope it is true, that everyone that's here and everyone that's, that's kind of listening has a desire to be used by God. I hope that that's your heart's desire. Included in that assumption Certainly included in that is the assumption that you have come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Saviour by trusting in his shed blood to cover your sins. You cannot serve God unless you are first saved. You can't serve God and be a vessel unto his honour unless you are first forgiven your sins and brought into his family. But if you trust in Jesus Christ as your Saviour, then the Bible is very clear that you've been given at least one or perhaps more spiritual gifts that God has given you for the intent of use in service for him, for the edification of the body and the glory of our Saviour. 
God desires us to serve him. And I trust that you, if you're saved today, have a desire to serve your God. But there's more to serving God than simply wanting to or talking about what you want. The truth is God is at work in us, developing us, that we may be the kind of people that are more and more useful to him. We must grow in our service. And as we look at the life of Nehemiah, we learn as we observe him many character qualities and faithfulness in service and effective traits of leadership. We see all of this bundled up in his character. He's a wonderful example for us to consider. The book of Nehemiah falls neatly for us into two broad divisions. The first seven chapters deal with the reconstruction of the walls of the city of Jerusalem. The the last chapters from chapter 8 through to 13 deal with the reinstruction of the people. The construction, the reconstruction of the wall and then the reinstruction of the people. Nehemiah arrived in Jerusalem in 444 BC, about 13 years after Ezra had returned. He was a great leader whom God used mightily to pull off what is a phenomenal feat. He instilled within God's people a vision. The remnant was stirred to rebuild the walls of the city of Jerusalem. And in spite of much opposition and numerous hurdles, this was a feat accomplished in just 52 days. The temple, if we know our history, had been rebuilt for about 70 years. But the walls that were destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar in 586 still lay in ruins. The city was defenceless. In Ezra chapter 4, we read of an attempt at rebuilding the walls that was ultimately unsuccessful. When some of the Samaritans and the other pagan residents around about Jerusalem had complained, they wrote and complained, petitioned Artaxerxes the king, And he issued a decree to stop the project. The enemies of God and God's people were victorious. But then we read of Nehemiah, and in the month of Chislu, sometime around November, December, 444 BC, we hear of Nehemiah serving as the cupbearer to Artaxerxes in Susa. And here he comes into contact with one of his brothers, and other men from Judah who came with report from Jerusalem. And they came bearing the news, and it was sad news. Nehemiah inquired of the condition of the people and of the city, and in verse 3 of Nehemiah 1, they said unto me, the remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. See, Nehemiah knew most of these facts. These walls and gates had been destroyed over 140 years before. But the graphic account, first-hand description on behalf of Hanani and the brethren that came from Judah, the news that was brought refreshed the burden in Nehemiah's mind and he was devastated. He he, He mourned, he wept, he prayed. He fasted and he entreated God to do something about these really deplorable conditions. And God responded in doing something, firstly in Nehemiah and then through him. Nehemiah had a burden for the people and for the city and he cried out to God and God answered, perhaps in the way, perhaps in a way that Nehemiah was not expecting, but God used him to write the reproach of the city. Firstly, we ask, who was Nehemiah? As we are introduced to him in chapter 1 of this book, we see him as the king's cup bearer. We see him as the cup bearer. Later in our book, we hear, Nehemiah hears the call to rebuild the city walls. God calls him to the work and we see Nehemiah the builder. And then in the latter chapters, we see Nehemiah as governor of the city, overruling the affairs of men, the religious and the social affairs within the city. But here in chapter 1, as God calls him, even before God calls him to this task, 
we see him as the cupbearer. Now, the cupbearer was not simply someone who held the cup like a butler to the aristocracy or royalty of our day. The cupbearer had a, a position of privilege and influence and great responsibility. He was there to make sure that the king was not poisoned and he would be there perhaps to taste and to confirm that the food was appropriate for the king to eat. But in the quiet hours, when the king was perhaps feeling free and relaxed, the cupbearer became a confidant, an advisor, a close advisor to the king. Perhaps Nehemiah and likely Nehemiah had some counselling responsibilities to the king. Many times the cupbearer is an official to the court with much power, travelling wherever the king would go and with him in the private moments. But let me say this to you. The reason God called Nehemiah was not because of his position. It was because of his burden. The reason why God turned to Nehemiah to be the man he chose to use, the man for the moment, were the characteristics we see unveiled to us in the first chapter of this book. And I would like to bring out three main points for our consideration today as we consider the character of the man God uses. We will see him to be a man of burden. We will see him to be a man of prayer and we will see him to be a man of action. Burden, prayer, and action. Turn, if you would please, to Psalm 79, just to give a little bit of perhaps context. Uh, The psalm here speaks, really describes what the city was like after it had been taken captive. Psalm 79, and we'll just look at verses 1 through to 4. This is a the psalmist's description of the condition of the people. O God, the heathen, are come into thine inheritance. Thy holy temple have they defiled. They have laid Jerusalem on heaps. The dead bodies of thy servants have they given to be meat under the fowls of the heaven, the flesh of thy saints under the beasts of the earth. Their blood have they shed like water round about Jerusalem, and there was none to bury them. We are become a reproach to our neighbours, a scorn and derision to them that are round about us. Verse 5, How long, Lord, wilt thou be angry forever? Shall thy jealousy burn like fire? What a description of the condition of the city of Jerusalem. And things had not grown much better. Since the people had come back into the land from captivity, Jerusalem ought to have been a city of praise, to God, a city of glory to the name of our God. But it had become a city of shame and reproach. You know, the building of the walls that we read of in Nehemiah didn't begin with the mixing of cement. It began with a burden in the heart of a man called Nehemiah. He was called to build the wall, yes, but first and foremost, the work began in his heart in his mourning, in his fasting, in his willingness to be afflicted for the cause of God. He had a burden for his people. The man God uses has a burden, has a burden for God's people. When God first wants to use you in some capacity, the first thing he does is to burden your heart with a situation. We know what that feels like. Perhaps like Nehemiah, you have had burdens laid upon your heart by the Lord, burdens to act, burdens to serve. Perhaps these burdens uh, perhaps start off generally and it's a, a real prick on your heart and you just know that this something needs to be done. But you're not sure how and you're not sure when and you're not sure perhaps sometimes why. Nehemiah had a burden for the people and he put himself to prayer and that burden grew. If you have a look in verse 1 of chapter 1, we have the dates for the the first report that came back from Hanani. We read of it being the month Chislu in the 20th year, November, December. Then in chapter 2, when Nehemiah finally goes before the king, before Artaxerxes the king, and petitions him for, for action between Chislu 
and what we read in chapter 2, verse 1, the month of Nisan, which is roughly our April, we have four months. Nehemiah was a man burdened with a burden growing for a number of months. He didn't immediately rush in before the king with his request to go back and build. No, the Lord caused his burden to grow. Nehemiah's burden was for God's people and for God's glory. You know, other Jews in captivity in Babylon would have heard of the conditions of Jerusalem. They would have heard of the need for God's people and the need for God's city. They would have considered the problem and just thought, oh, no, that, that's terrible. That's too bad. What a tragedy that Jerusalem lies in ruins. They perhaps give token thought to the need but quickly go about their own business. But the man or woman that God uses is burdened for the things that burden our God and his people. And that burden is not just a quick passing thought. It's a, it's a burden that works its way down into the very person that we are. Nehemiah felt their need. It's a mark of Christ-like love, is it not, to rejoice with them that rejoice and weep with them that weep. Nehemiah was burdened. He couldn't put it out of his mind and God caused that burden to be the catalyst for prayer and the catalyst for action. Man of burden, a man of prayer, a man of action. Maybe you're wondering, there are so many needs. You think and reflect for a moment, Lord, what are you burdening my heart with? And if you're sensitive to the plight of mankind around us, you perhaps will become overwhelmed with the needs. You might think to yourself, there's just so much that needs to be done. There's so much injustice and so much, it's just people being unfair and there's so much poverty. There's so much, many needs for the gospel to be proclaimed. The spiritual need is great. And we might become, if we're honest, overwhelmed. We can fail to discern what it is in particular that God wants us to do. A couple of observations when it comes to the burden that God rests on the heart of God's people. I would encourage you, don't let the sheer immensity of the need, the manifold needs around you, paralyze you to the point where you don't do anything. We can, in response to being overwhelmed by the needs around us, we can, in response, kind of put up an emotional wall and we can shut ourselves off from the burden. We can try and protect ourselves because we feel there's nothing that we can do. Therefore, we restrict that burden from really bearing down upon our heart. We do that for self-preservation purposes. Where that leads, by the way, is self... What would I say? Self-focused pursuit for pleasure rather than a God-focused pursuit for service. We need to make sure that we don't shut ourselves off to the needs of others. Matthew chapter 9, turn there please, Matthew 9 verse 36. Matthew 9 and verse 36. And you will know the context. Verse 35, Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Verse 36, but when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then said he unto his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth labourers into his harvest. We need to pray, Lord, help me to have the eyes of my Saviour that I would see the needs about me and be moved with compassion. And Lord, raise up workers for the harvest is plenteous. Perhaps raise up me. Firstly, don't let the weight of the need, the immensity of the needs overwhelm us to the point where we do nothing and secondly don't commit yourself quickly don't be impetuous don't say oh there's a need I, I'm, I'm going to fill it well that can be foolhardy 
Just because there is a need doesn't mean that we are the one God wants to use to meet that need. Now, don't think that I'm being callous or, or, or encouraging people to be careless or, or, or uncaring with people. But if you try and meet every need that everybody has, one, you'll fail and you won't be able to care for the needs that God has actually called you to care for. Don't be impetuous. Don't jump quickly when you see a problem. You need to wait on God in prayer until he burdens your heart with a particular need that you can actually do something about. We need to pray that God would give us a heart to feel the needs of the burdened around about us. By the way, I have had a number of emails and messages and phone calls from people during this coronavirus pandemic offering help. They just want to help people. But really what we need to do is spend some time praying and asking the Lord to lead us to the place where he wants us to be used, that we may help those who need the help. Nehemiah's burden was for God's people. Nehemiah's burden was focused upon helping meet, how do I say this? Nehemiah's burden was focused as he saw the people's great sin. He saw the spiritual. He was realistic in assessing the problem. He quickly realised that the heart of things was not a lack of organisation, but organisation was needed. They needed someone to organise the people to get the walls rebuilt, and that was what Nehemiah subsequently did. But the the initial observation, he recognised it wasn't, they didn't need someone to organise them. They didn't need resources, first and foremost, although they did. The great need of God's people was repentance. Great need was for people to turn from sin. In verse 6 and 7 of Nehemiah there, he confesses the sins of Israel, the sins of the fathers, and his own sin. He recognised that sin was the issue, that it was that the people had forsaken God and God's ways. In verse 6, Towards the latter part, he said, For the children of Israel, thy servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee, both I and my father's house have sinned. You know, the Bible is very clear that the root of our problems, even our global problems and our personal problems, is sin. Why are there wars? Sin. Why are there issues of famine and disease, it's sin. Likely Adam's sin, but also individual sin. Why are governments and businesses riddled with greed and corruption? Well, the answer is sin. Why is the mission task of the church, go into all the world and preach the gospel? Why is the Great Commission neglected? Sin. On a personal level, Why do couples and families argue and have problems communicating? It's sin. Why do children become rebellious to their parents? It's sin. Why do we face the problems we do? And it might be personal sin, as I've mentioned. It might be original sin of Adam and Eve and a result of the the curse and the fall. But if God is going to use us to alleviate the problems that we see around about us, we must recognise that the problems around about us are caused by sin and the need is to lead people in repentance, to help them to see their need to turn to their saviour if they're a Christian. And if they're lost, they need to turn to the one who died on the cross for their sins. We need to repent, we need to turn. How can we... By the way, Nehemiah was pretty plain there. He didn't just confess the sins of the children of Israel or the sins of the people that are living in Jerusalem and haven't put the walls back together. I mean, he's heard about the condition of Jerusalem and when he goes to confess sin, he doesn't start by saying, well, the people in Jerusalem have sinned, Lord, and I I pray that you would forgive them. No, he includes himself. I and my father's house have sinned. If we're going to help people, If we want to be the kind of man or woman God uses, we must be burdened 
by the need, needs that we see around about us and recognise that that need is spiritual and the solution is that sin needs to be dealt with. But we need to make sure we remove the beam from our own eye so that we may be used to help with the moat in others. Don't get distracted from the root of the problem. Nehemiah needed to organise the people. He needed to organise resources for the task and he needed to motivate and give a vision for the people along the way. But firstly, he needed to confess the sins of the people and his own. The burden in his heart led him to be a man of prayer. The second element or characteristic of the man or woman God uses is that they are men or women of prayer. In verses 4 through to 9 of Nehemiah 1, we see of the prayer that he makes, a supplication under the Lord, a prayer for divine power. In the state, having been informed of the state of, of desolation of the city of Jerusalem, he now makes a supplication for God's work, his power. Now, if you and I were in that position, if we were honest, if we're honest with ourselves, if we were a, a counsellor to the king in a position of influence where we could kind of petition privately the king behind closed doors, if we had the ear of the earthly king, I think we might be prone to ask him to do that for us. But Nehemiah didn't make that mistake. He didn't go to the earthly king to whom he waited upon, perhaps even who he had some influence with. He went to not King Ahasuerus or King Artaxerxes, pardon me. He went to the king of kings in prayer. You know, there are about 10 prayers in the book of Nehemiah recorded for us. It starts in chapter 1 with prayer. It ends in prayer in the end of our book in 13. We read in verse 1 that he prayed he mourned, he, he fasted and prayed. If you have a look in verse 6, you see some of the language that he uses and I don't know that we've ever prayed like this. Pray to the Lord, let thine ear now be attentive and thine eyes be open that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant which I pray before thee now day and night for the children of Israel, thy servants. He prayed day and night. When was the last time you did that? He prayed day and night over something. He fasted. When was the last time you fasted and prayed? He mourned and wept in prayer. Do you remember the last time you were overwhelmed with grief as you prayed? And he did this for months, as we mentioned in the opening, fasting and praying for four months before the opportunity arose for him to go before the king. And next time we'll, we'll look at this in chapter 2, verse 1, we read that Nehemiah had a, sa a sad countenance in chapter 2, verse 2, actually. The king asked, why is thy countenance sad, seeing that thou art not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. See, the king noticed the burden at work in Nehemiah. The work had started in God's man. Before a finger had been lifted to rebuild those walls, Nehemiah 700 miles away, had started the work on his knees. Chuck Swindle, he says very revealingly, for many of us, prayer is too often an afterthought, something rattled off at ribbon cuttings when the work has already been done. We need to pray first. Nehemiah, and if you remember our sermon from last Sunday evening, where we talked about a, a quiet time and our pattern for prayer, we actually see that pattern utilised by Nehemiah here. In verse 5, we read of his adoration, his praise. He says, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God, or the great and awesome God, that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. He praises God. It is good in prayer to start with praise because it puts God in his place and keeps us in ours. It casts away the shadows of our doubt when we come before him wondering, is this God able to answer? Well, when we start our prayer rightly by exalting and adoring our God, 
then those doubts and fears and the shadows of doubt are cast and driven from us. He starts off with praise or adoration. O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. He moves on in verses 6 and 7 to confession. He confesses his sin and the sin of the fathers. He wasn't just standing back and pointing the finger. No, he puts himself in the mix. And in verses 8 through to 10, he goes on and he, he, he claims by faith the promises that God had given to the children of Israel. He asks God to remember what he had said he would do. He's here making petition and supplication based on God's promises. He says, Lord, you said if we sin, you'll scatter us. But if we turn, you'll bring us back. Lord, we return to you. He says in verse 10, These are thy servants, thy people, whom thou hast redeemed by thy great power and by thy strong hand. O Lord, I beseech thee, let thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant. This is passionate and emotional language. If you have a look in verse 6, and if you prayed this way in our prayer meetings, perhaps people might, might raise an eyebrow. Imagine praying and asking and saying, Lord, listen to me. Lord, look at what's going on. And some individual, perhaps with a Pharisaic attitude, might say, well, actually, you know, God always listens and God always hears and he always sees, he, he always knows. And theologically, that's true. But Nehemiah here is, is imploring God to be involved in his situation. And this is very personal and emotional language. Lord, open your eyes, open your ears, remember your promises. See what a burden does to a man's prayer life. What do we do if we don't have that kind of burden? We look at Nehemiah and then we look in the mirror and we think, that's not me. How do we develop this kind of sensitivity to what God would have? There are a couple of issues that we need to consider. Firstly, if we don't have any kind of burden for the lost or for the, the, the group of God's people or for the glory of the Lord, then there's a very real chance that we're, you're not saved, that you're not born again. If you're not concerned about the things that God is concerned about, then you need to, you know, you need to trust the Lord as your saviour. But if you're born again and you still don't feel burdened for the lost or for God's people or for his glory in the earth, it probably means that you've been so caught up with the things of this life that you've turned your eyes off his kingdom and his righteousness. And you need to get back to Matthew 6, verse 33, where we need to seek these things first. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Nehemiah didn't hear the conditions of Jerusalem and say, oh, that's too bad. I hope someone does something about it. No, he committed himself to the task and he stuck with it within his heart and he prayed fervently for months. He was a man of burden, of prayer, and lastly and, and very quickly a man of action. He was willing to turn his back on the luxuries of the palace. He had a very luxurious job. You would say, well, that's until the, someone tries to poison the king, and I suppose that's true. But he had a job where he would enjoy the finest of the fine. He would enjoy um, the luxuries of the palace. And as one close to the king, he had access to the most powerful man in the realm. Some early documents of history reveal that the cupbearer was often the keeper of the royal signet and might be charged with the administration of the accounts even serve as second to the king. That certainly was true in some instances. In the palace at Susa, there's been some excavations which have shown that that building was once cedar, gold, silver and ivory. The walls decorated artistically with double glazed bricks of various colours, um, reliefs of winged bulls and all sorts of, of artistic work. Nehemiah, Nehemiah would have had the best that the world could offer, which reminds me of Moses. Do you remember in Hebrews talking about by faith Moses 
uh, was willing to suffer affliction with the people of God, turn his back on the luxuries of the world. Well, Nehemiah here, in response as we see this story unfold, to the burden and the need, was willing to lay aside the luxuries of the world. Was it a costly sacrifice? I mean, it was a hard journey to Jerusalem. It was a hard task to marshal the people to rebuild the walls so that God's honour and his reputation could be restored in the eyes of the people. It was a hard job, but was it a costly sacrifice? Well, yes and no. Yes, he had to give up much comfort, but no. Because could you imagine Nehemiah being happy, serving the king in the palace while God's name and God's people laid a reproach? He found great joy in doing what God called him to do. Second thing about Nehemiah's action is that he was willing to overcome the obstacles. The rest of this book is an account of how he overcame one problem after the next. He would face problems from outside the camp of God's people. He faced problems from inside the camp. But Nehemiah persisted and his faith was demonstrated by his works as he led the people to complete the task in 52 days. When you and I try and do anything in service for the Lord, we face opposition. Sometimes that comes from within the church and perhaps that's the hardest to overcome. But if we come, if we want to be a man or a woman that God uses, and we need to be burdened, prayerful, but also willing to act. The man God uses is a man of burden, a man of prayer, a man of action. The truth is, men and women like Nehemiah are rare. But they are to be found. Men and women like Nehemiah are not merely content to get answers to prayer, but they want to be the answers to prayer. He had faith in God to use him for his glory, and was willing to be poured out as a vessel in the Lord's hand for the Lord's glory. I wonder, do we share that burden? I mean, do we share that desire? Do we want to be used of our God? Well, there are some observations from the character of one who was used greatly in service for our King. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our time in your word this morning. We pray that you might help us to reflect upon the character of Nehemiah and that we might, perhaps as we consider in the mirror our own character, help us to see ways in which you would desire to work in us to make us more useful, more usable vessels of honour to you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.